Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this morning, today's Gospel from Luke chapter 8. In the name of Jesus, amen. The account Luke gives us today of Jesus' encounter with a demon-possessed man is striking. It bears out for us many truths about life whether that life is lived in Christ or apart from Christ. Jesus steps on land from a boat and immediately encounters a demoniac. This man was possessed by many demons. For a long time he wore no clothes and had lived among the tombs of the dead. You could say that he was dead even though he was still breathing. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his knees and cried out, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. What the man is saying, according to the Greek text, is what do you and I have to do with one another? In other words, this man and Jesus were as far apart as day and night. He didn't belong to Jesus, and the demons wanted things to stay just the way they were. But the dynamic of the spiritual life is revealed by what the demoniac says next. I beg you, do not torment. In other words, do not torture me. Now, why would this man or the demons inside him ever think that Jesus would resort to torture? Isn't this the same Jesus who says in John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him? And as far as the demons were concerned, they and Satan caused their own fall. Whatever end they had coming was their own doing. But Satan is the father of lies. He'll do whatever he can to paint a picture of Jesus that's simply not true. This demon-possessed man is the very picture of unbelief. The philosophies of this world, beloved, are empty. We must remember that in the spiritual realm, biblically, biblically speaking, there's no such thing as being neutral. Either you drink from the well of the world's teachings or from the spring of God's eternal word. What you spend your time doing will lead you either toward your life in Christ or away from him and his church into a spiritual wasteland. That's what happened to the demoniac. Look at his situation. Here he was in the desert alone. He had no name except Legion, the name of the demons. This namelessness suggests that he was forgotten. Being alone and without a name, these are the characteristics of damnation. Just the opposite is true for the baptized in Christ. Those who believe in Jesus and are baptized are named, and they're yoked together with Jesus and all the saints in the body of Christ. Christianity is the gathering together of the saints. It's being in oneness with Jesus and with all other believers in Christ. Luke's account of the demoniac highlights for the church a very important part of Christ's earthly journey, for it exemplifies for us the encounter between Jesus and the lost. This man was lost, lost to the world and lost to God. He had obviously drunk from the wrong water source and had poisoned himself. But Jesus came down to earth, 
stepped into our reality and encountered this demon-possessed man. Suddenly, the lost was found. Jesus was this man's only hope. People couldn't get near him, even when he was in chains. He lived among the dead, as a dead man among the living. But Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, entered this man's world and stopped the demons in their tracks. As the account unfolds, we hear that Jesus cast the demons into a herd of pigs who then rushed into the abyss. In the end, the man was found sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind. This is what happens to those who live their lives in Christ and become part of him. This man was put in order, so to speak. To sit at the feet of Jesus signifies that he become a disciple of Jesus. He now drinks from the springs of life, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful outcome. If only that were the end of the story, but it's not. For there's a tragedy that follows, and you and I do well to take heed of it. Jesus had come to these people. He showed them a miracle in healing the demoniac. Jesus has power over the demons. Hallelujah. So what's the tragedy? Luke records. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So Jesus got into the boat and returned. The Lord's hand in the life of one so forsaken showed the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God incarnate, God in the flesh. But that was too much for those who liked the world. They didn't know what to make of the demoniac, but they didn't want to deal with the spiritual realities either. The tragedy is, that they saw a miracle. They saw the hand of God in their midst, and they wanted it gone. Jesus, God, came to them to bring the light of life, and they asked him to leave. And he did. Oh, beloved, we must be very careful. This is a warning to all of us. For many people are like the people of that region. They treat church more like a country club. They like the activities. They like the social aspects. But to delve into the depths of truth, that's uncomfortable for them. Good and evil, God and Satan. Many people just don't want to deal with these issues. But everything comes at a price. The people of the Gerasenes, in turning Jesus away, left themselves more vulnerable than ever to demons and even to Satan himself. Dear friend, what is church to you? Is it the wellspring of life that conveys holy words and holy truth? Is it, is the gospel Jesus' way of encountering you and changing your life forever? Is the Lord's Supper his very interaction in your life, which imparts to you the forgiveness of sins and strengthens you as you journey in him? Is it true that the preaching of the gospel 
and the eating and drinking of Christ's body and blood do for you what Jesus' command did for the demon-possessed man. Beloved, a miracle has happened. Your sins are forgiven. Satan is cast away as you're brought closer to Jesus. You're sitting at his feet as the gospel is proclaimed. Your life is put in order, gathered together with God's people and made holy. And yet, living in this world, we can't help drinking in its philosophies as well. They corrupt our thinking and poison our hearts and minds, leading us away from Christ. We have to distinguish ourselves from the evil influences around us. We have to resist being pulled away from Jesus. Don't be fooled. Your world is trying to do that to you. You must make yourself aware of it, and you must resist it. I'm not suggesting that we can unplug from society completely. That's impractical. We do live in this world. But we don't have to be of this world. See, Jesus has set you apart. He's marked you with a name, his name. He knows you and he's clothed you, not just with any old clothing, but with his own white robe of righteousness, which is yours through baptism. He protects you, draws you to himself, and leads you forth in the goodness of his love. One of the places he leads you is to his church and his altar, the means of grace. If you can't help drinking the poison of this world, you can certainly balance that with the antidotes of the gospel, the words and sacraments. The tragedy for us is that many people don't. Even many self-professed Christians take in far more of the world than they do of Christ and his gospel. Don't fall into that trap, beloved. The world is making you spiritually sick. Don't avoid the only medicine to cure that illness. The word of Christ and the body and blood of Christ. Come and take your medicine regularly that God may keep your faith alive. Thanks be to God for his undying love for the pneumoniac, for you and me, and for the whole world. His love comes to us, sets us free from the bondage of eternal death, and gives us the gift of eternal life so that we, like the demoniac, may find ourselves seated at the feet of Jesus, drinking from the spring of life. Let us never turn him away. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.